Previously on the World War series, World War II, Aliens, Hijinks Ensue, watch part one on the Alternate History Hub channel to get caught up to speed. Well, we're now on to the final two books of the series. Like part one, this won't talk about characters so much as general events to pique your interest. I still highly recommend that you read the books if you ever get a chance. They're good books. Before we start, the militaries of the world would like me to play this new special newsreel. As the global struggle against the lizard invaders continues, scientists abroad as well as back home here in America are working on ways to counter the extraterrestrial threat. Thanks to cases of pure accidents as well as brave testers, we have discovered the weakness of the alien invaders. To the typical human, you might know this powdery substance is ginger, great for cooking as an herb. But to aliens, we have discovered that this herb has a narcotic effect. Similar to opium or perhaps alcohol, this herb upon being ingested by the aliens causes them to be lazy defiant to the orders of their fleet lords, and ultimately sends them down a path of horrible addiction, making them less of a threat for us and more of a threat to themselves. Therefore, it is highly recommended that all soldiers report to the nearest available base when possible to pick up a supply of ginger to be used to sabotage the enemy. If you are a civilian, do your best to get some ginger in case the aliens arrive in your home so you can attempt to subdue them. By giving them ginger, you give humanity a greater fighting chance. Well, that was very informative. So the end of part one, the humans seemed to not be doing that well against the invasion. Even though the Axis and allies had put aside their differences and agreed to fight together to save humanity, the aliens known as the race and their technology seemed to outmatch humanity at nearly every turn. Except for the Navy, ironically, since the race's home planet was mostly dry and lacking in large oceans. So the race doesn't even have a Navy. But there is one thing humanity was already working towards that could perhaps upset the balance and strike the balance in their favor. That, of course, is the atomic bomb. If they couldn't drive the race off the planet, they could at least provide enough atomic destruction to bring a halt to the fighting. The race already used two of its bombs over Washington, D.C. and Berlin, thinking that the humans would surrender. Obviously, they had no idea how stubborn we truly are as a species, and it only helped us collaborate and work faster on gaining atomic weapons. Thanks to collaboration as well as the lucky capture of plutonium in the Soviet Union from the race, at the very end of Book 2, the Soviets detonated an atomic bomb on race forces advancing towards Moscow. Now Part 2 begins with, of course, the other nations getting their bombs and the race realizing that Pandora's box had been opened. How does the race react? They practically panic. They were already shocked that humanity advanced from medieval times to 1940s era technology in the time that they did, so the idea of suddenly getting atomic weapons in just a few years makes them absolutely freak out. In an effort to try and strike a blow to the human forces, the race tries an invasion of the British Isles. They land in central and southern England and try to take the island, but Britain was not having it. Churchill authorizes the use of mustard gas on the aliens. Remember, this is about defending the planet Earth, not a standard world war, so any idea of the Geneva Convention against the aliens is completely out of the window at this point. The race did not expect this weapon by any means, and the gas forced them to retreat, also leaving behind alien equipment. Things begin to turn around quickly. The race is simply too different from humanity to anticipate the things that humanity is willing to do. The other nations begin using gas weapons too against the race. Siberia is also too darn cold for invasions as usual, and of course drug dealers and addicted aliens are spreading ginger throughout the ranks of the race. To make things worse, not long after the Soviets got the bomb, the Germans and Americans get atomic weapons too. The race now has two choices. They can bring their entire atomic arsenal and obliterate humanity as a pest while they can, or they can make some sort of peace. Remember, the aliens still want to colonize the planet with their own inhabitants. If too many nukes are used, the planet is uninhabitable. All of their planning goes out the window. In order to preserve the mission of colonization, the race agrees to make peace with humanity. So what does the world look like? Well, the race isn't leaving the planet. A good chunk of the planet will be lost to the aliens. They had to negotiate some loose ends too. Remember how I said the race didn't have a navy so they didn't really bother with messing with too many islands? What happens to the tiny islands? Since they didn't take over all of Europe, Asia, and America, where do we draw the lines at? To show what the new world map looks like, let's go continent by continent. South America and Africa are completely in the hands of the race. They were run over quickly, they're warmer, and therefore more suitable for the race's reptilian physiology. They had no intention of giving Britain its colonies back from those areas either. 
Wait a minute, you say? Britain beat them back pretty badly. Wouldn't they have more diplomatic leverage? Well, Britain never got nukes. So as you can probably guess, the three nations that did get nuclear weapons were going to have more leverage at the negotiation table. Britain and Japan happened to be two nations where they'd certainly be able to negotiate too, but the race could afford to screw them over a bit more. And it's not like the Germans or the Soviets would mind. North America is a different story. The United States earned its territory back in full. In addition, because Canada is so darn cold and was never really invaded in the first place, Canada keeps its independence too. The Caribbean is how it was before the war. There are the British colonies, but also an independent Cuba, Haiti, and Dominican Republic. All three of those nations, however, are under US guaranteed protection. The race thought about taking them because of the whole tropical paradise thing, but the US said absolutely not. In addition, Greenland, which used to be a Danish colony, is now under joint American-Canadian occupation, since the Germans still occupy Denmark and they weren't going to have them take over Greenland. Europe is in an interesting situation. Britain has its independence, and therefore, so does Ireland. But what about the mainland? Since Germany had control of most of Europe when the invasion began in 1942, they keep most of that territory. Honestly, after all the fighting, humanity kind of goes, ugh, fine. Sure, there's Switzerland, Sweden, Finland, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, which are all still independent, but Germany is clearly the main power here. They also even get to keep Italy and occupy them as well. Sorry, Mussolini. But there's just one exception. The race does not want the USSR and Germany sharing a large border, and would rather have a large buffer state between them. So the race keeps Poland and German East Prussia. Germany is not happy about that, but after the other nations give them dirty looks, they sheepishly go, ugh fine about it and grumble for the rest of the meeting. Spain and Portugal also remain race territories. The USSR also keeps its territories, including the land it took from Finland and the Baltic states. They wanted to try to take all of Finland, but Finland just threatened to give its military bases to the race, so they got to keep their independence once again. France is upset that they don't get their homeland back, but they're not out of the picture. We'll get back to them a bit later. For Asia, it's kind of half and half. The race conquered large chunks of Asia already and essentially keeps the entire Middle East, India, and China under its control. The Soviet Union keeps its border, but not Japan. Most of Japan's mainland Asian conquests are gone. The only mainland territory they keep is Indochina. Why? Because it's mostly swamp and full of scary Vietnamese gorillas that the race did not want to deal with. Japan also keeps control over the Indonesian islands, Philippine islands, the islands of Hainan and Taiwan, and even Singapore since it held out. The Pacific Islands and Australia are in an interesting state. The race did invade and colonize Australia. In fact, they considered Australia's desert climate to be a sort of paradise for them. So they were absolutely keeping it. And they even nuked Sydney and Melbourne to make sure it stayed that way. But remember, the race didn't really bother invading the small islands. So for New Zealand, New Guinea, and all the other Pacific Islands, the race let the humans keep it. Since Japan took over large chunks during the war, they got to keep a lot of the islands, as well as now all of New Guinea. But the British, Americans, and New Zealanders get to enjoy keeping their own territory. As for Australians, they're miserable and mostly immigrate to Canada because they don't want to live under the race. Poor Australia. However, the Pacific also now has the head of the French government. Because Nazi Germany got to keep mainland France, the free French forces under de Gaulle had to continue their operations elsewhere. With French colonies elsewhere gone as well, the only places left were in the Pacific. Now the French capital is on Tahiti in French Polynesia, so all former French colonies in the Pacific remain French. Oh yeah, and Antarctica continues to be an icy barren wasteland that nobody wants. The race creates diplomatic relations with the US, Germany, and Soviet Union since they all got atomic weapons. Japan and Britain have recognized sovereignty, but since they never got nukes, they're not getting diplomats. So it's 1944, the war is finally over, and this is what the world looks like. The race makes Cairo its capital for the Earth colony, and now both sides are forced to live in this altered Earth, dealing with each other's existence while plotting to outdo each other at every turn. The race thinks that this peace is temporary and that someday they'll get their revenge. But you won't find out what happens a generation later unless you read the sequel series colonization. However, we won't be covering that in this collaboration, maybe for a future time. In the meantime, I'm Emperor Tiger Star, and thank you for watching. Oh wait, final wartime new count! That's a total of 11 atomic bombs, compared to 2 in World War II and 9 in the Southern Victory series by Harry Turtledove.